going to um, go forward next with Professor Turnage. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about antimicrobial susceptibility testing considerations for TDM. And Professor Turnage is a senior medical advisor at the Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare. And he leads a program for implementing national surveillance for antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic use in human health. Uh, he's also the scientific secretary for the European Committee on Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing. So, Professor, if you're able to. Um... Yes, I can show you my study and my COVID wear to give this talk. Lovely, thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'll just move to share screen now and um, uh, so I need to go back a few slides, sorry, and talk to you about uh, susceptibility testing in consideration of TDM. Um, uh, I can't in the time available give you all of the juicy bits that I would like to talk to you about. But one of the important messages I'll give you before you even start is most labs that you deal with, microbiology labs you, you deal with, do not understand what I'm about to tell you. They're stuck in a time warp 40, 50 years old, maybe even 70 years old, and it's taking a lot of work and time to get people out of this space. Um, and uh, the literature that they've got to review is extremely limited. So that's part of the reason that we've got to keep working to get these messages out. And it's critically important to you guys um, uh, because, uh, because of this phenomenon. When we talk about uh, therapeutic drug monitoring for antimicrobials, I will introduce you to the term, skip the word concentration, please don't use that. Uh, the ideal term to use is exposure. And of course, as you know, there are three um, pharmacodynamic um, indices. They are the time above MIC, uh, the AUC, <clears throat> MIC ratio, usually over 24 hours, but not always, and the peak divided by the MIC. We use the free fraction because we've got fairly firm evidence that it's only free drug that's available. And we use uh, uh, percentages for time above MIC um, uh, as, a, as a way of uh, comparing different agents. The important thing I've got there is highlighting that the MIC is effectively a denominator in each of these uh, uh, per, uh, parameters, each of these indices. And therefore, in order to do appropriate therapeutic monitoring, you need to have an MIC value. Some of the other things that a lab will do, whether they've got a MEC gene and they're methicillin resistant, whether they've got a zone diameter because they've done this diffusion will help you with any of this. You do have to have an MIC. Just so you know, actually uh, monitoring both the, uh, the patient exposure, the time above MIC or the area on the curve, and, and looking at the organism susceptibility um, that are inherent in those um, dynamic indices. Quite an old idea was first put up by Jerry Shentag in 1984, and um, he called it dual individualization. It never caught on then, um, but it, it took the whole science of pharmacodynamics to get it moving. Um, and the acceptance of saying um, to get people back to the space that where we're talking about today, what can we do uh, from the uh, uh, microbiology lab side to uh, uh, give an answer to that uh, denominator question that we might see. Um, so just to uh, summarise what that's about, we determine the patient drug exposure um, and uh, our previous two speakers have both addressed some of the uh, issues about that. And um, Amanda, I'm very, very cognizant of my time at Women's Children's Hospital about sampling and trying to get ideal exposures uh, for area under the care of drugs for like an antibiotic side. 
Um, but the microbiology lab uh, also needs to determine the MIC of the pathogen. And they can do that by any method with high correlation to the reference method. Why do I say that? It will become clear in a minute. And then, of course, you may need to yeah, you may need to adjust the dosing regimen to achieve optimum exposure. Why do I keep using the word exposure? Well, for things like uh, beta lactams in particular, we can do a lot of fiddling with dosing intervals, and we can also use prolonged infusion. So we can uh, keep the total daily dose the same and yet increase the exposure. So that's why exposure is the third term. So I've given you the hint, there's a pivotal role for the MIC in this whole process. And this is the learning curve that you and everybody else in the world is having to go through now because um, there's a problem. So I would start with a new concept. The MIC only job is to work as a brand unifying parameter in pharmacodynamic industry. So in this context, it is invalid to compare MICs with any single blood level, tempting though it is. And how many times have we all done that over the last 30 or 40 years? It's not a good way to use the MIC, it's misleading. Um, so I like to put it in a different way, I like to say the MIC is just a number, a number that indicates the intrinsic sensitivity of an isolate to a uh, particular agent as measured in our test tube. That's all it is. And therefore, any discussions about the fact that MICs are done in broth and it doesn't represent what's going on in, in vivo um, is to my mind, irrelevant. All we need to think about is the MIC working as a reproducible number um, that, that works in our pharmacodynamic uh, indices to give us target value, and then we can massage ourselves. So, uh, the um, <clears throat> important thing to know, though, is that without MICs, we can't work out the pharmacodynamic targets. And without the pharmacodynamic targets, we can't work out the dosing regimens. We have matured to the point now where many dosing regimens are being uh, redesigned and reanalyzed, knowing the pharmacodynamic targets and uh, things are improving. So you want to know how to get an MIC. Um, <clears throat> well, there is a reference method now. It's an ISO standard. It's called 076. 7.7.6-1, um, it's undergone its first revision and it was released last year. Um, it's referenced by um, broth market dilution, um, done in uh, newly in broth without, really without additives, depending on the species you're examining. At least in most parts of the world, this is not a practical test to reach in. It's clumsy and expensive, time consuming. And so, very few labs ever use this as a routine part of practice. It's a little bit more popular in the US, but even then they've got a lot of drugs to put on a single plate and there's competition for space. Every other method is a derivative method. And there is a method, there is also a system, a companion document to 0776, which tells you how to compare your derivative method with that of the reference method. That document is also undergoing revision as we speak and may undergo some, hopefully, un, undergo some significant improvement. What your average lab in, in Australia in particular will do is use a semi automated system like Biotech or a Phoenix. The problem with those is that they're often short concentration ranges, so you get results such as less than or equal to or greater than. Um, so, with these off scale results, there's no way you can plug those values into your pharmacodynamic indices. What's more uh, widely used if we actually want to get a number, to get one of those numbers is to use a gradient diffusion test, the original uh, test was E-Test, um, now owned by Bia Mario, um, but there's an Italian company uh, called Bia Filchem, which now 
also produce a similar product with a similar performance characteristic. The problem is that we're now just finding out that correlation with the reference method is not always as good as we like. And it's largely because the comparative standard, ISO 20776-2, isn't up to the job of detecting those um, any inherent bias in those systems. Um, that's something that will be corrected with time. Nevertheless, it's what, these are what most people will use if they want to do pharmacodynamic uh, 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 monitoring of patients, um, they will rather depend on a gradient fusion method to give them an MIC. So just to reiterate, there is a reference standard, all other methods are the derivative, and they require comparison using uh, uh, ISO 20776 2 Also to reiterate, most routine labs don't even know this. They only just come to terms with the fact that there is a reference method, which has been around for 14 years. Um, and uh, many people uh, uh, think that the reference method can be ignored and they can just go on and do an MIC by able way. They like them, that would be the right answer. That is incorrect. So, the main part of my talk is to tell you about the MIC as an assay and to also tell you it's not very good. In fact, it's frustratingly uh, not as good as we would like. Um, so, uh, I've obviously made <laughs> a boo boo there. Let me just slip out and, uh, and uh, fix that animation for you. Uh, and uh, hopefully that will sort it out. Yeah. So this is really important information for you guys. That this will be in uh, a sort of mental space that you're used to. If you're in pharmacology, you know about all of these things. In microbiology, we're only just starting to learn them. So by comparison with all other assays in, in, in microbiology, chemistry and hematology uh, um, labs, MIC measurement is a rather poor assay because of high inter-laboratory variation high intralaboratory variation, sometimes high reagent variation uh, due to inadequate standardization of the reagents involved, especially here and here. Um, strain to strain variation or biological variation between isolates. And generally, when we look at uh, data that we generate, we get uh, coefficients of variation in the range of 50 to 100%. Well, that's a throw out assay in all of the other labs. We wouldn't even start. In microbiology, we haven't got an option. So much data has been generated in pharmacodynamics using this one the assay, we kind of stuck with it for a short period. And last, but not so obviously least, the, the twofold dilution theory is actually two cores, uh, uh, and we need a finer scale. It is available on those gradient diffusion tests with markings in between standard twofold dilutions. Um, so that's a little bit of a step forward, um, but not as much as we would hope. The other important thing from all of this is that it, um, this variation has led to a myth. And the myth is that the error of an MIC test is always plus or minus one dilution. Um, that is deeply ingrained in the microbiological psyche and um, despite my efforts that trying to tell everybody something different, um, so far, it's a more or less a default position for almost all of us um, because of the coarseness of the scale with which we're using. Interestingly, if you applied that idea through our pharmacodynamic indices, that means that every PKPD target is itself a value over a fourfold range. That's not particularly satisfying, is it? And we're not going to adjust the dose of uh, gendomycin for four times um, to, uh, uh, to ensure that we've reached that upper end of the target range. So, um, so given all of that, here's an essay with poor precision and poor accuracy um, when compared to the kinds of results that you guys can get in some kinds of labs and plasma and tissue problems. So one of the uh, 
questions we have to ask is why do we see this variation when we generate graphs? Why do we see MICs distributed across a, a range of values? And I've explained all of those assay variations. Um, and what we don't know is what relative contribution we have from those different sources of variation. A, a colleague in Switzerland uh, actually did some work with zone diameters to try and sort this out. And there was no consistent findings. It varied between bugs and it varied between drugs. But at least it was a start to try and look at this. But for some combinations, um, strain to strain variation, biological variation was dominant for others. Almost all of the variation was due to intra-laboratory variation. And there's a table in the publication here that you could choose to look at and entertain yourself if you so wish. What I will show you though is another uh, a table, and this is a table presented to the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute in the US, which also set the other big breakpoints that embody from the one I've worked with. Um, and they do have a, a standard method for uh, developing QCs, um, which involves taking it in this case of a new drug, and here's a standard quality control strain, um, tested in the lab, tested uh, approximately 30 times in each of eight labs um, over a, a consecutive period of days, yep. ideally 30 days, so 30 separate assays. And here we can see the sources of variations for this particular strain. So we can see uh, reagent variation, we can see uh, the animation isn't. Here's the reagent variation, three different lots of mulahin. So this one gave lower values. We can see intra laboratory variation, so the variation within a single lab, and we can see inter laboratory variation. Um, and of course, we won't see biological variation. This is the so look at all those different answers. Which one's the right one? What's the real MIC? And I would say there isn't an answer to that question. Um, the important thing to this, let, let have a look at this study and say, well, you know, um, your lab, you asked for an MIC, you want to do therapeutic drug monitoring. The lab got uh, uh, 0.03 for this particular bug drug combination. What do I learn from this particular quality control study? Um, is that um, it's 40%, 70% likely to be that answer in lab A, only 7% likely to be that answer in lab B, and 20% likely to be true in lab C. Um, so uh, the uh, <clears throat> in interesting thing is that if you look at labs B and C, uh, if they repeated the test, chances are they would get a higher value the next time. Of course, they never repeat the test, so you never know that. Um, just relating to the response here. Yeah, so let me look at this another way. And so you measure the lab and get it and, the, uh, and get an answer this time, 0 0.06. Um, taking into account all the sources of variation, so the, uh, the summary data in that bottom row, as it is now and testing a single isolate, what are the chances of the MIC being 0 0.125, 0 0.8%, and for all those other MICs, uh, a range of uh, probabilities of what, what, the, what people would call the true MIC. Well, there's not much published information. There's a lot of data in um, quality control studies um, that are available sometimes from CLSI and UCAS. Uh, but not near enough for you to be able to apply usefully. Um, <clears throat> there has been one study now published showing, looking at MIC variation, this time using E-test, 25 strains of staph aureus, te tested in five Dutch laboratories against Lenezolid. And the conclusion was fairly clear from this study. A single measurement may only provide an indication of whether it likely belongs to the wild type. In other words, without any acquired resistance mechanisms. And only repeat measurements of the MICs of individual strains within one laboratory would provide an indication of differences between susceptibility of strains. 
Hmm. Well, that just sum summarizes how uh, problematic the MIC test is. So why the hell we keep using it? We haven't got an option. Um, so, nevertheless, um, Johan who gave this work and I worked with him on this. Uh, we thought this through and came up with a proposal that was published in 2018 about how to manage with a not so great assay. And the answer was um, uh, to use this little table here um, to uh, decide whether the isolate and the MIC that you found in your test is within uh, the wild type, uh, otherwise defined as having an MIC value less than or equal to the epidemiological cutoff value. Uh, if it doesn't, if it's above the epidemiological cutoff value, you should use the MIC you've uh, uh, um, uh, measured and add two to all dilutions to that. In other words, multiply by four um, to work out um, what the MIC uh, could be uh, and then <clears throat> plug that into your pharmacodynamic index. So finally, I just want to know, uh, point you to the fact that we do know about wild type infusions. They're available through UCAS through a specific website. Um, this is just about to go an upgrade with a little more useful information provided, including assay variation. Um, uh, but uh, these will be able to guide you. You'll be able to find out what the ECOFs are. And the reason that this system works is that epidemiological cutoff values merge data uh, from multiple methods and multiple sources. And in this particular example of Lampicillin and E. coli, 52 data sources were used to generate um, this log normal distribution of the wild type, which you can see highlighted in blue. You do have to look at each bug drug combination individually. It doesn't work for groups of bugs, it only works. Um, for individual species, so you'll get a different picture for Proteus mirabilis than you would for E. coli when you look at these graphs. Um, in, in other words, just to summarise, it is possible to use a single MIC measurement in, in, making, in uh, getting PKP target attainment in the individual uh, patient, but to do, and do so in the full understanding of the limits of the test, and by all means, use the table um, that was reproduced in 2018. From my point of view, one of the other burning questions is can we ever improve this assay and get greater precision? Um, and the answer at the moment is no. Nope. In fact, worked with um, many people in the United States a few years ago to try so you can tighten up the assay. Um, but it proved to be a futile exercise. We stuck with uh, a lot of uh, unstandardized uh, parts of the system for the meantime, and uh, it'll take some years before we break out of it. Um, and I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brock. That was. Um Really good talking. That's um, understanding the real variability of MIC and how it might impact on um, how we apply that to our targets. Uh, I should also mention too that um, Prof Turnage is a CI of the CRE Reduce. Um, he's been a key member of the team um, and very generous in his time and support of training for new and emerging researchers. Thanks very much to Prof today.